we've published this, uh, this book for the last, uh, the last six years. And uh, it's very, very exciting what we have uh, to share with you uh, today in particular. Uh, really is a, a different, a, a turning point in the last 12 months that indeed is going to inform uh, the book for next year and I believe a lot of your activities uh, going forward. But in the book, we talk about the fact that there is now a clear way forward to rebuild this business based on digits and based on atoms. And a very, very profitable way to rebuild it. We've gone from publishing this book every year for the last six years, making prognostications, looking at trends in innovations that were, uh, had a, an increase in reach and relevance in revenue. But for the first time this year, we are talking about a prescription, a very clear way that you can take from the book and from the cases and indeed prescribe a way forward for your business and build a plan of action accordingly. And there are five keys to this success to rebuild the business that for us are sure bets with demonstrable results and indeed key elements of your future. All the routes to this transformation will take you through one of these roads. Mobile, you know it, but it's very important in the chapter where we'll talk about it today. What we talk about in mobile is entirely different. It's not mobile as it's been preached even in the session today. Really what we come here to tell you about mobile is quite thought-provoking and indeed uh, quite relevant to perhaps a lot of the missteps that we're taking when it comes to this transformation. Video, if you want to grow the top line, grow your video content. It's a no-brainer. The web is becoming a visual medium. Facebook has overtaken YouTube in terms of video views. It's the way this medium, the digital world in which we live, is going. People want to see things r rather than read them. So indeed, this was a medium that started as stack space, which is our strength. And yet, if indeed you want to grow the top line, invest in video, quality video. Native advertising and branded content. We've heard, just heard a reference about this. Um, any business, any digital business that you pretend to sustain it on display advertising is unsustainable. The business of selling page views and unique viewers is dead, and we talk about it in the book. The key engagement figure for you to discuss and to sell to your advertisers is time spent. This is what they want, and the volume business that we thought our business was about attracting those viewers and selling them that those huge audiences is not relevant anymore. Native advertising is then replacing that display advertising model and replacing it with phenomenal, phenomenal returns. Programmatic, it is not a race to the bottom. There's a lot of money to be made as well. Uh, CPMs are increasing and programmatic across the board, even for selling print. In the book, we talk about how to get your head around it and indeed how to let the robots uh, take over, especially a lot of that display advertising that you should wean yourself away from as you make a transition to a time spent engagement metric for your digital audiences. And events and e-commerce, these two things together, for many, many of our clients and many people we've talked about, it already accounts for 20% of their new revenues, new revenues that they didn't have uh, before. So all these, all these must be part of the new business model mix. Uh, so in the book, these are five of the innovations we talk about, but we're here to present to you three new ones, three key innovations that we think are very relevant for you to keep an eye on that we will talk about uh, next year, but we think they have a lot of traction and they're very, very fascinating. And indeed, we think we will be part of that mix that we just showed to you. So those were the five. John is here with the three. OK, first one, micropayments. Not new news, right? They've been around for a long time. People had questions as to whether they would work. If they work, they answer the toughest what if questions media has. What if you could read all the journalism you care about in one place? What if you would only need to register once to read everything you want? What if you would only pay for the articles that you were interested in and actually read and liked? What if you wouldn't be pressured to subscribe? 
What if you wouldn't be bombarded with ads? What if you could get your money back if you didn't like the story after you read it? Enter Blendl. Out of the Netherlands, a year and a half ago they launched. All the major Dutch newspapers and magazines are on this site. In a year and a half, they have acquired 400,000 registered users. And for me, the best part about it is they're two-thirds are under the age of 35, the very people that we've been trying to get unsuccessfully. An estimated 5,000 new users are signing up every month. When I was in Utrecht, I was approached, somebody knew I was a journalist, and two young kids came up to me, 25, 27, and they said, have you heard about Blendl? I said, no. They said, it's great. We love it. We go there. How often do you see that kind of passion in young people about a news product, a content product? One in five in the Netherlands top up their accounts constantly. The average article is the equivalent of 20-some cents American. The average refund, the, the publishers were very nervous about the idea of giving money back. We don't want to do that, right? But what happens is the readers just like to know that they could, because most of them don't. But they like to know they could. Average refund is only 10%. They're launching, they just launched in Germany. They have every single major daily, major magazine, and major weekly but one. And in the beta test before they launched, the users topped up their accounts at an amount five times higher than the users in the Netherlands. And it's money from people who were never paying for journalism before. It's not cannibalism. These are people who are buying articles who weren't buying before. These guys. The founder says, my friends never paid for music or movies until Spotify and Netflix. And now, with Blendl, they're paying for journalism, often for the first time in their lives. The publishers in Blendl split the revenue. 70% goes to the publisher, 30 to Blendl. And outside of, the United, outside of the Netherlands and Germany, they're publishing the Washington Post, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and The Economist. Another micropayment case here in Canada, the Free Press in Winnipeg, this is the editor. Of course, they're losing print circulation, and they were upset about that. They looked around, and they found out where their former subscribers had gone. Well, guess what? Their most avid online users were the very people who had let their subscriptions lapse. So all they did was switch. They went from paying to free. And so Winnipeg said, that's enough of that. You get three stories, not a month, not at six months, in your lifetime. So those better be good stories, right? Choose very carefully. And then what they started to do was you have to register your credit card and you pay a flat 27 cents a story. They just chose 27 because it was lower than 30 and higher than 25 and they're gonna experiment with it and see what happens. It may go up higher for a longer story, lower for an obit, that kind of thing. 27 cents. Readers get billed at the end of the month up to the price of the online subscription. So they never pay more than they would if they were a subscriber. And they begin to figure out if they're a regular user that a subscriber makes more sense, a subscription makes more sense than the hassle. And it's working. The publisher says we get a couple dozen new casual readers signing up every day, and they're selling a substantial number of articles every day online. Here's another example. A company called Cointent. Probably haven't ever heard of that. I hadn't heard of it. They are doing two to five times more paying readers than the publishers draw with subscriptions. And this is a great number, 55% of the people they're working with, and they're doing beta tests with small publishers, 55% purchase another article. So that's fantastic. So what's happening is readers are clearly getting more comfortable with paying digitally. You got Google Checkout, you got Apple Pay. So micropayments is something you ought to look at. It's uh, an innovation we think is going to be very, very important in the near future. Let's talk about mobile first, because I, I mentioned, and of course there's a theme here, and we all heard uh, at nauseum the importance of being mobile first. But I'm here with, with a, a strong provocation, because our advice is, if you want a mobile strategy, don't have a magazine mobile app. I'm sorry, they just don't work. People download them, we get all excited, they don't come back. 
The average person has about 55 apps on their mobile. They tend to check six to eight a day on a daily basis. Magazines rate very, very poorly. We give it all the way to Apple or to Google or whoever. It's in their garden. We don't control it. And perhaps all of us are thinking, yeah, mobile first, that's what we must do, a mobile app. What well, we provoke and we ask you, is this really the way to go? There is another way. And perhaps you think, well, the way to do it is responsive. I've invested all this money in these incredible websites. Let's make them responsive. Let's make, make it frictionless, effortless, so people indeed now can consume the same content on their mobile, and it's a, 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 a seamless, seamless flow of the content. And many people ask him this question, is your website responsive? If it is, good. But it's not enough. It's not enough anymore to just have a mobile magazine app or a whole bunch of vertical magazine apps. It's not enough to have a responsive digital experience that just fits the mobile screen. You have to go much, much deeper than that. We're in Canada. Hockey, as you know, is massive here. And the great Wayne Gretzky once said, skate where the puck is. No, skate where it will be. So where's that puck going? Responsive and apps, in our view, are so yesterday. Really, we are playing catch up. Readers no longer just want your website to look nice on mobile. It's not just about that. Readers want a mobile experience that really delivers on their mobile expectations. Really, using the unique powers of mobile. And most of us are here, in a way, playing catch-up, running still behind. <laughs> and of course, we come to a conference like this with phenomenal speakers and wonderful content. But we are slightly behind when it comes to mobile, yes? You really have to make a transformation to becoming mobile first or mobile obsessed. Why? Because customers' expectations have changed. This is a mobile mind shift. It's a state of mind. It's a mobile state of mind. It's not us repurposing our content for the platform that is dominating the experience of our readers. It's a mobile state of mind. So it's not just a mobile-ready customer experience. It's deeper than that. This is becoming the new standard. 62% of total digital time in the US is already spent here. And if we're doing the same thing, repurposing shovelware, and then just doing a, a magazine, mobile app, or a, a, a derivation of our different uh, themes, it, it's not enough. It's really emerging as a self-contained experiential platform. This is a new medium that requires a different language, a different narrative, a different frequency. And I love the example of Facebook. I was in Cannes three years ago when Mark Zuckerberg said it very openly, very clearly, we missed mobile. And then he went about changing everything, yes? But they didn't just make their website and their digital desktop experience mobile friendly. They didn't do an app. They didn't do responsive. They really changed the entire business, yeah? They designed a completely unique mobile experience suited to smartphones. and an entirely new advertising platform as well to monetize on their mobile experience. Now, more than 50% of their revenue, it's from mobile. And we are convinced that if you get it right, if you apply this kind of innovative, transformative logic to your mobile approach, you can get to these levels because the audience is there and the advertisers are following. But if all we're doing is just mobile apps, magazine apps, and if all we're doing is responsive, we're missing the boat. So, so do not repeat. Do not just build your mobile experience on your legacy foundation. Really, treat it as a new starting point. Don't take the website experience and try to transfer it. Don't trade the workflows and try to transfer them to a mobile version. Really rethink it all. Because otherwise you're iterating. You're really not innovating, yes? So we really don't need incremental change here. This is not about incremental change. 
is about complete innovation. And readers will punish you. Indeed, they will, they will go to other platforms and other experiences, but it's been done correctly. And in a moment, I'll show you one which is quite disturbing, how big an audience are taken away from a lot of magazine titles here. So you must publish content that is unique uh, to mobile. And this doesn't mean snacking. It doesn't mean that you abandon long form. It doesn't mean that you abandon a lot of the things that you're good at. It does not mean that. But you have to begin with unique content and a unique mobile schedule. H have a look at this. This is unbelievable. This is the New York Times. And they're quickly going to start abandoning the mobile app, mobile uh, responsive approach. And this is a sneak preview of how they're actually doing uh, the whole strategy. It begins with mobile moment driven mobile programming. Yes. They first chart a day in the life of their mobile user. And they figure throughout the day, what does that person want from me in terms of content? What is their experiential demand of my brand at different times of the day and indeed at different rhythms, biorhythms? At times in the morning, I'm in a rush, I'm moving along, I want a different kind of content. And they break it down to this level. At 7 a.m., they have a newsroom doing content that is just this kind of mobile-only content. Prepare me for the day. At 9 a.m., make me feel connected. At 11 a.m., help me follow a developing event. All this is charted here. At noon, improve my lifestyle. Help me plan. I'm relaxing. I already checked, caught up with my email. I'm at work. You know, help me, help me plan uh, other things and, and really look at my lifestyle. Uh, at 3 p.m., update me on what I've missed. At 4 p.m., at 9 p.m. This is a multi-deadline programming obsession when it comes to mobile, yes? And also, you need to have a unique mobile team that, that really gets mobile. Now, who gets mobile? If you want to look at the best case at the moment, it's Refinery29. This is the world's first mobile-first women's magazine. It's genius. Do they have an app? No. Is it HTML5? Yes, but it's a mobile, complete, total experience. It's an untethered app that is born and exists as a mobile experiential experience. These are their offices. This is the obsession that they have with the uh, news consumption cycle and, and, and consumption content needs of their audience. Uh, they're launching a new mobile experience in uh, every city in America every quarter. They're in New York, they're in San Francisco, they're in Los Angeles, and moving on to Chicago, to Miami. And they use, they use Chartbeat which is also used by a number of publishers, but obsessively based on mobile. These are the screens you see around the newsroom or the editorial department. They're obsessed with the prime times of their mobile people. And what do they want from me at this time? And at this time, I'll give them a little appetizer, and then I'll give them something heavier, and then I'll give them something else, and something else, and something else. And these people are the ones that are taking away uh, millennial audiences interested in women's or lifestyle issues. They are the ones that get it, and this is the level of transformation that we encourage you to do and not just uh, retreat back to doing magazine apps or doing uh, responsive versions of it all. And then, of course, it's wearables. Wearables, because remember, the mobile experience is not just your telephone. It's much more to it than that. In Cannes this year, I saw a demonstration of a technology company that have shirts, t-shirts with digital screens. And they're showing uh, a bunch of girls at a party, and they're taking photographs with their mobile and displaying them on their Instagram on their shirts. Now you do have textile uh, digital screens that are blendable enough. You have to hand wash them. But this is already coming. It's here. And you will have to put your magazine on a t-shirt very soon. It's coming. What, will you do an app that you have to you know, go and download? And, uh, geolocation, something that we've been trying to crack for so long. It's now fascinating how through wearables is happening. Advertisers and readers uh, are, are getting ahead of us, really. Uh, and they're low energy signals. Look out for Apple's iBeacon and Samsung's proximity. These are fantastic solutions for in-store mobile connections. We'll write about it in the book in detail. And we have phenomenal insight to the makers of this and, and some early, early adopters in the magazine world. Yes. 
half of the top US retailers, they're already working on in-store beacons to improve the shopping experience. Yes? And 20% 20, 20 of Americans alone uh, own a wearable. A wearable, not a mobile phone. We know how many people own a mobile phone. But again, next year, we will be talking about, uh, no, it's not the mobile first moment, now it's the wearable first moment. But if you're still, again, in the dynamic of doing apps and doing responsive, we'll never get there. Finally, let me talk about culture change. And what we picked up this year, Media Hubs. Media Hubs is a great way to bring about the culture change that we all need to indeed uh, deliver some of these fascinating content, experiential experiences. And I start with an obvious and perhaps not so obvious thing. Innovation is not imitation. We are not Google or Facebook. We do storytelling, we do journalism, we don't do algorithms. Our job is not to emulate this big digital platform makers and, and distributors of our content. We have to really, if we want to bring about culture change, we have to change something else other than try to emulate them. Experimentation, yes, but look, failure is overrated. And there's been a great culture of, oh, you have to fail, you have to fail, fail again, fail again. As we say in the book, there's a real clear prescriptive way forward. And you indeed can begin to build a plan of action with little failure if you indeed follow certain strategies. We know enough about what works to, to really embrace it and implement it. And innovation does not happen in a vacuum. It will not happen because you come here, you take notes, you get great ideas, you buy our book or some of those books, and uh, you read content, and you go back and sort of preach it to your troops. It won't work. It does not happen in a vacuum. You need that culture change. And it doesn't happen because you hire natives, millennials, what have you. It does not happen because of that alone, or you create the famous, remember, innovation labs or the skunk works where we have uh, uh, the, the, the A-team, and these are the guys that are working on the new products that are coming out, and yet the rest of the newsroom or the editorial office doing the same old. Yeah. Innovation has to permeate everything, everybody, and really every bit, everywhere of your organization. It must start and end on the editorial floor. If you're not seriously, seriously contemplating creating a media hub, you're never going to get through to cultural change. It'll never happen. So how, how do you reorganize to, to do more great things than ever? To innovate, you must change the organizational structure. We just heard how editors have a, a, a different job definition. The workflows have to change completely. In the digital age, there are no dailies, there are no weeklies, there are no monthlies, there are no quarterlies. It's always on. And if you want to be relevant in mobiles, if you want to be re relevant in wearables, where your people expand your brand to exist in the coming years, you have to change your workflows. You have to change the biorhythm of your editorial office. Obsessing about the consumption cycles of your audience and producing content for the right people at the right time. You have to change the architecture. The physical space has to change. The job descriptions, the staff mix, the culture. And you must integrate your teams. You must reward risk taking. He who never made a mistake, never made a discovery. How are we going to discover these new narratives? How are we going to discover these wonderful products that make us relevant in the digital age without mistakes? And you must flatten your organization. And if you use architectural change to bring about conceptual change, you can have a flat organization. And that means that you do management by walkabout, and you create a dynamic where departments that didn't talk to each other now talk to each other and create the magic. And you must give developers, data analyzers, and visual journalists a place at the planning table. And the cases I'm going to show you, this happens. A developer can pitch a story and get a story done. A data analyzer can pitch a story and get a story done. He has the same voice, the same stature as a traditional journalist. The journalist will always be better at finding out you know, what makes a story tick. But data analyzers, developers, Visual journalists, you give them a place at the table. Vox Media is doing this so, so cleverly. In Washington, fast growing. And this is their newsroom. And indeed here, when you ask them, how do you work together? It says, well, we're all BFFs. 
best friends forever. Yeah? And these are people I would never ever consider talking to, and yet we talk to each other. And you talk to them about integration, they scratch their heads saying, what the hell is, what are you talking about? We start with just a digital language to begin with, and indeed, curiously enough, they're considering doing print as a result of the success of their digital content. But print will be treated as yet another outlet for the wonderful content that they're creating. Uh, look at Vice. Vice connects with millennials as no other brand does. And when I visited, uh, it, it's, I call it video game journalism. <laughs> it's extraordinary how they do their own agenda. Really, the dynamic here is one where content just flows, where anybody has a voice and a vote. And indeed, uh, there is uh, a, a looking ahead at technology uh, at all times, rather than looking behind, as unfortunately our industry sometimes is. And Refinery29, if you get inside their building, and if you look inside, it's fascinating how they're organized. This is, for instance, in one of their other offices. So some of the mantra, positive, authentic, adventurous, innovative, open communication, listen, respect, integrity, adaptive, accountable, supportive, and exceed expectations. This is not just words. They're doing it. These guys are doing it with phenomenal content for women that is tremendously relevant to them. Even their lighting is chic. So look, what really matters to conclude is, is, is journalism, uh, editors, wild ideas, and, and crazy people. We need to bring back this magic in our media hubs, in our editorial floor. We have to bring this back. Many of you have it because the Henry Lucas and the Mavericks created phenomenal print titles but we have to bring it back to the digital age. And it's not going to happen because you hire young natives to supplement, complement, to support old print editors who are brilliant and good and fantastic at what they do. You, you must create a different culture uh, to indeed make it all happen. Editors who focus on, on great writing, still great writing, on constant reinvention and picking up new gadgets uh, with both hands who are looking at the Oculus Rift, the digital t-shirt, the microwave news, the news in a marmalade pot. All these are devices being considered today. Your editor should be knowing all about it, embracing it and bring it into your editorial offices and newsrooms. But what happens often? Fear. Fear is a mortal enemy of creativity. And creativity is a fuel of innovation. Innovation is, is indeed your guarantee to success. But it's that fear of the unknown that holds us back and kills the creativity and prevents the culture change magic that we need in our media hubs. And if you accept change, you never grow old. And it saddens me sometimes to see so many magazines growing old because they just don't accept change. Change is what we do at Innovation. We're enablers of change. We really are helping a lot of media companies uh, to do so. These are some of our clients. And it is, it is time to, to innovate. Thank you very much. Before we go, I'd like to let you know that the book is available. We've dropped the price by almost half. If you'd like to get the book at the Phipps, uh, Phipps stand over there, we've got these for just 40 uh, pounds. And then tomorrow, I want to make sure you get upstairs for the innovation track. We're going to have just a kick-ass session with all sorts of speakers. We're going to talk about innovation and content sharing, video monetization, audience insights, ad effectiveness and ad fraud, tech innovations, content that leads to learning, experiences that leads to new revenue streams, uh, cross-platform innovations, social media, and even some innovations for small publishers. So get upstairs early to get a place. And we're going to be there grilling them. We're not going to let these guys make any just kind of grand statement. We're going to play journalists to them, and we're going to say right up front, what was your innovation and what was your impact on the company? So see you tomorrow. <laughs>